is Steve Halford. I, was, I am the retired art teacher uh, at the time called creative structure teacher from Rutland High School. And when we moved here from the old school in the early 90s, uh, I saw a great opportunity to decorate these walls, which were very bare and new. So the challenge was to make permanent student artwork uh, that would last. And now, 25 years later plus, uh, they're still here. And nobody knows who did it. So this is part of what we're here today, is so we can record for history just what was done. We took a look at the walls, and this was our first attempt at a permanent artwork. Fortunate for me at the time, there was an artist in residence, which time has eluded me, and uh, I don't remember her name, sad to say. Uh, but she worked with me out in my room, the creative structure room, and we built boxes and brought in a lot of sand. And I had piles of junk, just oddball pieces of this and that. And, and we just heaped it in a pile. And the students laid these boards out on the floor, these square frames, filled them with the wet sand, and proceeded to press in oddball pieces of junk, you see pipes, wheels. The whole theme of this was the labor of Rutland. Because uh, the Rutland community had been a, a community built on labor. So this was our theme. And you'll see this picked up with uh, the pipes, the fists, the hammers, the trains, uh, everything that was involved in, uh, well, labor. And then after they were pressed into the white, moist sand, we took plaster. Plaster Paris, and we poured it into these uh, impressions. Then when it set, we pulled them out, and they refinished them down because it was just a big glob of sand on them. Uh, scraping, sanding, it was very messy. And I learned later, clay and plaster don't mix. So whenever a little piece of plaster got in clay, it'd blow a hole in it when it was fired. It was a nightmare for me for a while till I could get all the plaster out of the building. But after they were shaped up, the little squares, then it became a big puzzle to arrange them. And then thanks to maintenance at the time, who stepped in and framed them for us. And that was very uh, helpful, because it really added to the piece to have them framed as they were. At the same time, we did another experiment that worked out. I built from an old electric kiln uh, converted it, it was burnt out, to a gas kiln. We put it outdoors in the back of the creative structure room, built a little shed for it, a little overhang, and turned it into a, a sort of a furnace foundry for casting aluminum. And these here are aluminum, and we pushed them into a Green sand, which is a finer sand than that sand up there, did the same 
sort of thing. But then cast them, we cast them in aluminum. The start of this was brought on by Glenn Campbell, who uh, was Campbell's uh, casting and uh, the plaster and iron. But he, at the time, had two students that were his uh, children in this high school. So he, he was a really great parent that said, how can I help? And boy, did I put him to his task, because he showed me how to cast aluminum. Uh, we did these with my rinky-dink operation, and it worked. So that only invited me to pursue it to even greater lengths. This was done by Fred Lauer, uh, who was the art teacher at the time. And I was the creative structure teacher at the time. And uh, he was just involved in trying to uh, make the school look, make the students a part of the school, I guess you'd say, because this is all student artwork you're going to see. We're going to talk here a little bit about the history of what was produced here. But along with making artwork is giving the students a background of what they're doing. Of course, the theme here was, was uh, work in Rutland. And one of the major uh, industries in this area was, of course, the railroads and the marble industry. And as you can see in these, a lot of this is depicted. Now, there was one incident that really amused the students, and it was quite an incident. If you look up midway on this one on the right, you see a skull there with a rod through it. Uh, I guess what happened, and I don't know when it was, but over probably over 100 years ago, uh, a railroad worker was uh, putting a charge of explosive and they drilled a hole and he was packing it and it exploded on him and put the rod right through his skull. Just, and the amazing thing, he survived. But it changed, they, like they said, it changed his personality, but he did survive. So the students were quite interested in that, and one of them did predict, uh, depict it up there. One of the things that you might think is, where the heck did we get the time to do something like this? Well, at that period in the school's history, they had what was called a Jan plan. It was in January. It was for two or three weeks. It was a long period of time, actually, where students could sign up for disciplines they wanted to explore in. Some people did uh, science, uh, history, phys ed, etc. There were all kinds of offerings. And my offering was to do this. Uh, so I had a lot of artistic students sign up for this. And we had this golden opportunity, which they found was cut in too much into the academics, and they had to cut it back. But it was for a couple, maybe three weeks, we got to work on this every day. So it was uh, quite a venture. And it was, uh, we took advantage not only with these here, but as you'll see later down the halls with other pieces where we could have never done this later with a short period of time. I think they still have a Yes Plan. I don't know. Yes Plan was end of the year studies. This was January studies, mid-year. But uh, it was, gave us that time, uh, that block of time where we were able to do this. After the sand castings, 
and that were put on the other wall. We started looking around at other various areas. We had this big open area up here. And we decided, after a lot of discussion with the students, of making, so every individual had a part in it in, that was part of this uh, Jan plan. Each student took and made a face in clay uh, in what was called a three-quarters view. If you notice, they're sort of facing, and they had to be all facing the same way. Uh, we had to have a good talk about face proportions because uh, most of them didn't know and get it wrong about putting the eyes too high up in the head. So we had a good like, few lessons on uh, portrait work, then went into making this in clay. Then once they were made in clay, they were fired, glazed, and then we took those clay pieces and from what we learned before with the aluminum casting, we put them in what you call green sand boxes, uh, casting boxes. And those were lent to me by Glenn Campbell of Campbell's Castings, which repeatedly he was my savior. Uh, and we went about casting these. Now, here's a kind of a funny part about this, is we said, well, okay, where we're gonna get the aluminum? Well, at the time, I don't even know, this is you know, 25 years later, um, they had juice machines here that had aluminum cans. And at the time, they were, cans were being thrown away. So I said, we're gonna recycle them. So I'd have either I or art club members would go around in the afternoon after school and collect the bags of aluminum cans and bring them back to the creative structure room. And the kids delighted in stomping the cans flat. And we stomped them and put them into our rinky-dink kiln and melted them down. It was uh, quite a process and we probably processed over 2,000 cans. Just constantly gathering them through the year because this was planned ahead of time. Smashing the cans, putting them in a, an iron box that was in the kiln that had a crack in the bottom and a little bowl underneath, a aluminum bowl, or not aluminum, but a metal bowl. Stuff it full, fire it, melt all the cans. We'd get a little pile of aluminum and gathered up a lot of aluminum nuggets, as they might be called, and proceeded to cast these in our little uh, converted kiln out there. Quite a project. Uh, then mounted it on a piece of plywood, and in the front, I needed RHS. So one of my really good students uh, said, I'll do, the, do it after school. She'd come in and made that out of marbleized clay that was red and white clay mixed together. They gave it that red and white uh, marbleization. And she designed that, so I said, make it look like some kind of like a, a, a cornucopia of uh, RHS uh, spurting out these, these faces. And it turned out, we were very pleased with how it turned out. Um, after 
we had finished that year with the aluminum castings, uh, I had, through the year, learned from Glenn Campbell how to do lost wax bronze casting. Now, this is a very incredibly involved process that dates way back to early, early civilization, the Bronze Age, actually. And what is bronze? Well, it's a mixture of tin, and pardon me, not tin, tin, yes, tin and copper, mainly copper. And then you have brass, which is copper and zinc. But we practicing with a few lost wax casts said, wouldn't this be something if we could do all the disciplines, the six disciplines uh, in the school and have each student do uh, one of the lost wax uh, pieces and then braise them all together. Now this one here is one of the six and this is an example of the fine arts. And you see, oh, there's uh, musical instruments, dancers, uh, guitar player, painter, all the various elements of fine arts. Each student made it with the lost wax method. Now, let me back up a minute. What is lost wax and how do you do it? I have over here some samples of stages of how it's done. These are very simple, but they'll give the idea of how a lost wax piece is made. All right, I'm going to show you, like I said, very simple uh, lost wax process. This is a little horse head with a square mount. Now, to cast this in bronze, it will be upside down. You will have a funnel here to pour the bronze in. As the bronze pours into the cavity, it will be pushing air. So you need to have these gates that allow the air to get pushed out. Or otherwise, when you poured the bronze in, it'd get here, the air would stop it, and you would not get this cast in the front here, or the ears. So, you would take the wax, what we did to make all these, each student got, you know, as much wax as they wanted, but they had to keep their piece so big to work on the uh, uh, mounting there. They took hot water and small flame, like with a candle, and manipulated the wax, mainly with hot water and then scraping tools, but they shaped it. They manipulated it. They, if they wanted to stick two pieces together, they heated them up with the candle and stuck them and then rubbed it in. Then they put the gating on, which of course makes it look ugly, but it has to happen. Then when they were done, we took it again to my savior, Campbell's Castings, and he put a shell on it. Like this is a shell of a piece that never got fired. And then, this is where the word lost wax comes into being. You take this, turn it upside down, and heat it up really hot to where this thing's basically glowing. But the wax melts out, leaving 
that empty cavity the shape of this. So this, what you see here is a gate. And this might be a gate here, I don't know, it's hard to tell. But you wouldn't know what you have here till after this is cast. At this stage, you put it in a bucket of sand, heat it up so it's almost red hot, and you heat up bronze. And we were able to do some of these out at the creative structure room. Uh, I had a little crucible, which you could heat up with just like a little a cup uh, with silicon made of, so it heated up the bronze and you took a, a, sort of like a pincher tool, grabbed it, of course with gloves and face shields and all, because boy, this is like 2,000 degrees and it's molting uh, bronze and poured it into this cavity, this funnel here, and it fills in, the, the bronze runs down here, forcing the air out, and then sets it real quick. So you got to pour it quick and hope that it'll make all the places. And that's why this is heated up so it won't cool it before it makes its journey. Then we take this, you let it cool, take a hammer, smash it. This is bronze here of a little piece that somebody did. Now, of course, you can see where it was poured in here. Here's one of the gates that was coming up. It actually came up and touched here, but see the air, it didn't make it before the bronze cooled. So it didn't come out, but that's okay. Because now, and after all this, now becomes the work. This, this is where the work begins. You gotta take a hacksaw and cut off these <clears throat> gates. Now I'm gonna, I made this so You cut these off, and this is, of course, what you end up with. But after you cut them off, then you've got to take a hammer and peen it, or take a file or a grinder and work off, shape it back up, fix it. That spends most of your time is this what's called chasing, chasing it cleaning it up till they get to that finished stage there. Now, when they were first made, the bronze is shiny, like a bright brass, but it quickly uh, deteriorates in color. And so we, we also, we wanted it dark like uh, ancient brass or bronze. And so we uh, used uh, uh, liver of sulfur, very stinky stuff, smelled like rotten eggs. But uh, you brushed it on, you heated it up with a little blowtorch, and brushed it on, and then cleaned it down, and it made it that, that dark, and you could highlight areas. Over the years, the highlight areas have dulled on these pieces here, but they've been up there for almost 25 years. So they, they've earned the right to dull a little. Mm. Ongoing viewing of the six disciplines we did in the lost wax bronze. Here's the phys ed one. And you can see the various sports being represented there. And like I said, there are individual pieces at each that different eight students worked on this. And then Mr. Campbell breathed them together. And then we went and uh, put the liver of sulfur and 
then wire brushed them down and steel wooled them. And then they were, uh, had, we, I drilled screw holes in strategic spots and screwed it onto the wood there and uh, made our little background plaque. But that's number two of six. Here's number three of our disciplines. This is history. And, oh, let's see, nine students participated in this, all carved in wax, then uh, all the process that you saw, each piece was then uh, refined. They had to do a lot of sanding, hammering, a lot of uh, painting on them to get ca raw ca casted edges peened down. Uh, the room would sound like a whole bunch of woodpeckers gone with all the clanking going on. Uh, I'm really proud of what they did, though. And beautiful work. Here's our fourth discipline, language. And students depicted here as you can see, various things. I see a scroll, a sword being pulled out of the stone. But uh, all parts of literature, I'm sure that's... I see a raven. Lots of interesting concepts made by the students. Another one of the six disciplines. Here's our next discipline. Uh, science, as you can see, and each of the student again chose a subject matter, carved it in wax, and uh, proceeded to do all the, the effort to produce what they did, braze together, and there they are. And let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah, nine people participated in that one too. There's her science one. Here's our last discipline, mathematics. And as you can see, and again, the students have represented various symbols of math, scales, E equals MC square. I see a lot of different interpretations each student thought of. And that was part of their uh, lesson process was to come up with their original concept of what represented that discipline. So that ends what we did 25 years ago. Uh, amazing artwork these students did. Of course, now they're adults in various communities. I've kept in touch with a few of them. Uh, they're scattered about the country. They've done various uh, things they come they always connect with me, tell me what they're doing. I really, really appreciate that. And uh, some of them, uh, they remember doing it and some people don't. You know, and I say, go back and take a look sometime. And I hope these will be here for a long time to come because uh, I'm proud of them. They were excellent students. They put their all into it and we did something how many high schools have bronze castings that the students made? And I have to thank the administration, uh, Dr. or uh, I don't know if he was a doctor at the time, but Mr. Walk, I think he was a doctor. Uh, he allowed me to do it. And then Mr. Gee, he allowed me to do it. Real rinky-dink. But there they are, student made. Thank you.